So welcome everyone. It is will be the last uh, machine learning seminar of this year. We have a very special guest that came from University of Michigan. She's this visiting uh, Mario Figueiredo here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Laura is going to present us about uh, uh, Deep Laura. And I think it's going to be a very interesting. Thank you, Laura. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. So as Gonzalo said, I'm visiting Mario Figueiredo for a couple of months. Actually, I was supposed to originally come in 2020 in the summer, but it was canceled and delayed until now. Uh, and so I'm very excited to be here, to meet people. Uh, so if anyone thinks something here is interesting, wants to know more, or just you wanna share something about your own work with me, I'm very happy to meet with people while I'm here. Okay, so today I'm gonna to present a work about compressing deep networks, okay? And um, I really hope that you stop me if you have questions, because especially coming from so far away in a very different institution, then it might just be uh, that there's some things I'm assuming and not thinking about. And so if you ask me, I can clarify in the moment, okay? So don't wait till the end. Just interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so um, uh, this work, this line of work that we've been doing, which by the way is with uh, many wonderful collaborators, I can mention more at the end, but two main ones are my students, my PhD students, Su Min and John. Um, but it's motivated by uh, the current uh, excitement with deep learning, um, maybe for, Seven years, my students have been trying to get me to work on deep learning from the signal processing side, and finally they won. Um, uh, because, um, I mean, of course, it's you know becoming extremely important very broadly in machine learning. It's not only sort of solving you know vision and language problems, but we're hopeful it solves uh, many uh, much greater variety of problems. But not only that, in uh, in uh, language and image problem, it, it's, you know, uh, in the last two to three years really made a huge leap compared to um, the 10 before that. So um, we have chat GPT, we have programming assistance, um, image generation like DALI, uh, and then image recognition, which tends to be like proprietary products. Uh, they use massive deep networks um, and are able to have uh, incredible uh, accuracy in um, next word prediction or image uh, classification and problems like that. Now, um, the uh, accuracy and generalization abilities are amazing, uh, but the size of these networks is really, um, you know, nothing we ever would have imagined uh, before. Um, and so uh, as a consequence, actually, the only people who can work on these problems, like really on these uh, huge networks, training these huge networks are uh, at least currently major corporations. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, right now, companies like Amazon, uh, Facebook or Meta, Google, they're capable, OpenAI, I guess now they're capable of training these networks. Um, and I like to show this graphic. It's from a paper uh, from two years ago now, presenting a new um, deep uh, network architecture called ConfNext. If you've heard of ConfNext, it was a major um, paper that year. Uh, and uh, the, the authors of ConfNext were from Meta, so they're uh, you know, Facebook AI researchers, and they uh, developed their new architecture, uh, which um, has you know, uh, many 
millions of parameters. And then they compared it to these other architectures that are, uh, you know, were also like huge, <laughs> huge architectures. Um, and we compared the accuracy both, uh, this is called um, uh, just train on ImageNet 1K, which is a thousand images, okay? Uh, or they pre-train on, a, a, sorry, a thousand, um, a thousand classes, or they pre-train, no, 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 that's not right. What am I saying? Okay, let, let, let me uh, think about it. Per, I think it's 1K maybe per class, but anyway. So then, or they pre-train on this much bigger data set, this ImageNet 22K, uh, and then they only tested on ImageNet 1K, okay? So they pre-train and get uh, a network that uh, uh, has sort of the information from this huge data set, 22,000, uh, but then they only test on ImageNet 1K and report the, uh, the top uh, one accuracy, the, you know, the, the output class compared to the true class, okay? So, okay, so what matters is not saying, oh yes, you can see that Convex is better, uh, but that if you look at the table in their paper where they compare all of these architectures, uh, the total uh, computational requirement to make that table for one paper in a conference was 2.5 teraflops. Okay, so, you know, no one can do this except for a, has that kind of resources. And if we look uh, even more, you know, this is, this is something that's published, right? But if we look at what people guess about architectures that have been trained that we don't know exactly how much uh, computation they require. Uh, it's estimated that GPT-3 uh, required 355 GPU years to, to, um, to train, and that GPT-4 uh, is like 50 to 100 million dollars to train. Okay. So I think everyone, I see everyone nodding and th like this is a major problem, right? I mean, okay, so one that can be solved with lots of money, but we don't, you know, we want to apply machine learning to uh, problems and fields where, you know, hope, let's say socially uh, uh, helpful fields where they, or science, right, where they need uh, this kind of tool, but they don't have this kind of money, right? Uh, and so uh, the goal will be to make machine learning accessible more than, to, to more people than just like Meta and Google, okay? and open AI. All right, so actually because of this problem, uh, there's a, a framework, a kind of paradigm that's come out uh, that's actually quite nice. Um, it still in some ways relies on uh, the someone to have the resources to do this pre-training. Uh, but then after pre-training, uh, we can have a step of fine tuning the deep network for any given application and then inference, okay? Uh, and so um, uh, the goal then can be to make this fine tuning and inference these steps both, you know, highly accurate for new applications, even ones where we have only small amounts of data relative to the original uh, data set that was used for pre-training. Okay, but then also to, uh, you know, not only make them accurate, but make those steps also uh, computationally efficient as much as possible. And so that's going to be uh, the focus of what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, hopefully, actually, the, the things that we've discovered uh, in deep network architectures would be helpful even for it more efficient pre-training. Uh, but certainly, and the way we apply them is in this fine tuning step to take a pre-trained network and uh, have it be uh, applicable to some new data set, some new um, application. And uh, these pictures are here just to give examples. So uh, of people who are using this kind of paradigm with pre-training and fine tuning. So at the University of Michigan itself, actually, uh, the university has licensed through some like academic license, the ability to use, uh, I think it's GPT-3 pre-trained weights. 
Um, and so those weights are available in some limited capacity to some of like our IT research teams, basically. And they can then work with us on campus for different um, uh, applications that we have in order to try to uh, fine tune GPT-3 for the purposes that we have at the university for educational purposes. So as an example, I teach undergraduate digital signal processing. I've taught it now for 11 years. I have, you know, uh, we call it a learning management system, like a website that through which I interact with students. I have homeworks and they ask me questions. I have answers. My TA, my teaching assistant also gives answers, right, for those 10 years. Like our fine tuning data set. Uh, and our goal, we're going to, uh, we're implement, the IT people are implementing it now, and I'm going to be testing it in the fall when I teach DSP, uh, will be to have something that can answer questions for students like ChatGPT, but hopefully correct. <laughs> Though I did ask one homework question, like last time I taught it, and it was, it was wrong, but it wasn't like terribly wrong, so <laughs> it's not too far already. Uh, but, you know, that's exactly the idea is that, okay, yeah, I say, oh, I have 10 years of data, but that's still nothing compared to what ChatGPT is trained on, right? But we can fine tune it, hopefully, and, and uh, have some nice uh, uh, ap application for the students to be able to learn more from this uh, AI uh, software. And it's also happening in, you know, other, like in healthcare and, and other uh, research areas. Okay, so um, that's the motivation for what I'm going to talk about. But the key point um, of our research that our and the outcome that our research found or the takeaway um, was that uh, when we train deep networks, um, actually the weight matrices are not fully updated throughout the process of training in the sense that uh, only a small subspace of the weight matrix seems to be changed throughout the training process. This isn't like uh, universally true. Uh, and it's uh, what I'm saying is, is qualified by many assumptions and statements, okay? But uh, you can imagine that if what I'm saying is true, then uh, we don't need to store and, and train and update these like huge number of parameters, right? But instead could do something smarter in a compressed way that would uh, hopefully reduce the computation and memory requirements, okay? So instead of having to compute gradients for these very large weight matrices in deep and wide networks, and also store these very large weight matrices, uh, the goal is, what I'll tell you is that uh, the gradient descent dynamics will be in this invariant low dimensional subspace. So we want to leverage that to compress the training and storage, uh, the, the process, the training process and the storage of the matrices. And I'll show you plots like this again later, but this is a, a, a graphic of um, adapted layers of um, BERT, the language model for a language, a new language task. Um, and the adapted layer, uh, it's like the different layers of the network. Um, and then for that uh, weight matrix at that layer, we look at the singular values of the difference between the pre-trained matrix and then the one after fine tuning. Okay? And you can see that there's only like three to eight non-zero singular values uh, in these layers. There, there are some caveats also to this image. So again, I'll show it again layer, later and uh, we can talk about it, okay? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about first just some observations um, to, to see what we actually see when we look and try to investigate what's happening in the training process. Um, I'm gonna uh, give some theoretical results, uh, but only for deep linear networks, okay? So I'm gonna talk about deep linear networks for a minute and why they're not too boring. Um, then uh, I'll give you the theoretical results and we'll look at applications, okay? 
Is there any question before I begin? Okay. All right. So um, here's the note using. So we are just uh, have a standard machine learning problem. We have training data X labels Y. Okay, we'll have um, capital N number of samples. Uh, and we want to learn a prediction function, which has the form that deep networks have. Uh, linear uh, transformation of the data, followed by an entry-wise nonlinearity uh, and repeated several times uh, for the number of layers in your network. Okay, um, Usually the nonlinearity is ReLU. Uh, or softmax at the end of the process, okay? So this is the notation I'll be using, specifically this F sub theta, that's our prediction function, okay? All right, and then we're gonna train some loss function as typical uh, loss for, you know, each data point is actual label to the prediction we give, okay? And the loss, you know, can be whatever, typical loss functions that we use. The one we'll analyze is mean squared error, but actually we have some analysis also for cross entropy. Okay, so let's talk about the observations I mentioned. Okay, so um, here are plots very similar to the one I showed before, except looking at the uh, singular value index over iterations. Okay, um, so, um, we have uh, several different types of networks. This one is just a deep linear network. This is a multi-layer perceptron with ReLU. Okay, this is a, a well-known um, architecture called VGG for vision and another vision, vision transformer, okay? And uh, what we're looking at are the singular values of a matrix over time, okay? Over iteration in the training process. And the singular values are the difference between whatever's at initialization and what we have at time t. Okay. So just think, subtract off what however you initialize that matrix and then uh, look at the difference. Okay. So we can see um, in the linear model, it's like very sharply low rank. I mean, they, these values are non-zero. They're not, they're small though. They're very small and there's a big jump at some point. And I think, you know, this, whatever number, I think this is eight, like we were using just a linear network and the output matrix, fitting an output matrix that's rank eight, okay? Okay, but also the same thing, oh, sorry, this isn't even synthetic data, this is for MNIST, so it, it's real data. Uh, the same for the multi-layer perceptron uh, on MNIST, it's not quite as sharp of a transition here, but uh, the singular values drop off very quickly. Okay, and I guess in all cases also, you can see maybe like not most nicely on this VGG plot, that some of them start out small, uh, but then increase through training, uh, but the small singular values decrease through training. And uh, these two were trained with MSE loss, but these two are trained with cross entropy loss. So it's a phenomenon that you're seeing not just because of one type of loss function. Okay, so, um, oh, I forgot to remove these little notes. So see this little blue text there? That's like what I hide usually in my slides. So now you can see the things I need to remind myself of, okay? Okay, so um, in this uh, in this particular figure, uh, we're seeing this is the one you saw before. Um, some different look at the uh, adapted layers after fine tuning BERT, the thing I mentioned before, and that's for this semantic uh, textual similarity data set. Okay, so it measures. Well, you can you can read it if you're interested. So now I guess I don't even have to say it. <laughs> um, so it's an, it's an a regression problem and we train with mean squared error, okay? And uh, for each one of the um, layers, we can see that, uh, you know, when we train with this small amount of data in this STS data set, uh, the 
an updated layer compared to the original one that was from Birch is very low length, okay? And in fact, in this one here, we're plotting the angle of each singular vector uh, with the final, uh, with the final one it converges to, that it converges, you know, at a different rate for each layer, but quite quickly, right? Within the first, say, 500 to 1,000 iterations, it converges to this, uh, this uh, new adaptive matrix, okay? And the training loss uh, beyond that is still uh, decreasing, though more slowly. Now, this observation is for synthetic data with uh, linear networks, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, but this, this plot actually is what led to the paper that I'll talk about that will be presented at ICML in July. Um, so uh, what we have is uh, an exactly low rank data, synthetic data, rank three, okay? And we train gradient descent on a deep linear network. And what you can see here is that uh, the singular values of all but uh, uh, two times rank are staying the same throughout the whole training process, or maybe going down slightly. Okay. Um, actually, in this case, they're staying the same because we, oh, no, no, they are going down slightly because it starts at one. And then you can see it's slightly below one there. Okay, but the top singular values and the bottom singular values are changing. And this is the inner product, or sorry, the angle between the uh, vector at iteration t, the singular vector at iteration t with initialization. So you can see the top and bottom singular subspace are both changing, whereas this middle singular subspace is staying uh, at the um, small angle to initialization, okay? Same for the left singular vectors. Okay, so all of these observations, uh, which, you know, in, in, uh, in chronological reality, it was this observation first, this sort of simplistic setting that led us to, to run the experiments for those other real data sets and variety of different networks, okay? And uh, each one of these really gives us a, a, an idea that there's some fundamental low rank structure and low rank uh, process uh, that perhaps we can leverage to make the uh, training more efficient, okay? <clears throat> so um, implications of this and the results that I'm gonna show you, uh, both theory and, and empirical results, uh, are that that invariant subspace can be used um, to uh, focus the training to some smaller uh, parameter space, okay? Uh, and um, give like network compression and a more flexible low rank adaptation when fine tuning uh, large uh, language models or, or just foundation models in general, okay? And what we see over here uh, that you'll see again later is a plot of the trajectory of training for both an original network, a deep linear network and our compressed network. And you can see that they're identical, okay? And, uh, and here, this is the loss for the original and the compressed, and it uh, you know, decreases much more rapidly. Question? Okay, I thought I heard potentially. I'm sorry. All right. So let's talk about what deep linear networks are. Oh, let me. Okay. Oops. All right, so theoretically, I'm going to study deep linear networks. Um, it's actually not only interesting uh, analytically and, and like something easy to work with analytically, it also has some, uh, you know, not fully explored, but definitely uh, uh, practical applicability. And the main first one, and we're going to talk about in the experiments is that uh, people are noticing more and more that it, if you have deep layers in your network, so not the very shallow ones, but the deeper ones, you can actually replace uh, one layer with 
uh, collection like a sequence of linear layers, and you'll get improved generalization, um, of course, at a cost of more parameters. Okay. Um, so it doesn't compromise accuracy, often uh, improves. Okay. Um, it's, of course, easier to analyze the case of a linear network. Uh, and so we hope that the, our analysis here is a stepping stone to more interesting analysis of nonlinear networks. And we've, we started uh, working on that as well. All right, so the same setup as before where we have training data X uh, labels Y and data points, but we're gonna change two things. Uh, we're gonna change um, the, or let's say we're gonna, uh, specify uh, the nonlinearities in this uh, prediction function to be just identity, okay? So we have a linear network that's just a sequence of uh, linear transformations applied uh, to the data, okay? And of course, you can just write that as one matrix, and we denote that as WL colon one, okay? So that's just the uh, application of those linear operators to one another, okay? Okay, and uh, specifically in this part, we'll consider the mean squared error loss. So we're looking at the difference between our linear operator applied to X and the labels in squared error sense. Okay, so um, I want to uh, give some evidence for that uh, claim I made one slide ago that deep linear networks that we can sort of expand nonlinear layers into linear layers and we see some improvement, okay? So this is an experiment where we show a multi-layer perceptron trained with MSC loss on CIFAR-10. Uh, it's fully nonlinear, seven layers, okay? And you can see um, these are two measures of um, sort of uh, the inner workings of a deep network. Uh, and one of them is the uh, training accuracy. That's this blue curve, okay? And of course, it increases uh, as you go deeper into the network, okay? That's something that has been uh, a hallmark of deep learning, okay? On the other hand, uh, the rank of the weight matrices, weight matrices decreases. And actually, this is uh, known as sort of like a, um, a compression, okay? So we're... Uh, bringing class um, values together so that they can more easily be distinguished. Oh, I think I stepped on something. Okay, it's back. All right, so um, now what I'm gonna do is take this same MLP, well, not the same one. I'm just gonna um, take layers three through seven and have them be linear, okay? So I'm not training uh, all of them with the nonlinearity, only the shallow layers, okay? And actually, you'll see then that the training accuracy and layer, I don't know if I show it right away, but I know I have test accuracy plus as well. Um, it stays, uh, you know, very high. It has the same kind of behavior where it goes up quickly in the shallow layers and then stays high. And then the compression, the rank of the weight matrices is also dropping. Okay. So shallow layers, the, the sort of, you know, summary that people are uh, perhaps, you know, have lots of evidence for now, is that shallow layers are the things that are increasing separability between the classes. Mm -hmm. And then the deep layers are increasing the compression within the classes. And you can do that with uh, linear layers in the deep part of the network. Okay, another uh, related plot uh, is one that looks at uh, specific metrics of discrimination between the classes and compression uh, uh, within each class. And the same type of thing happens if you look at linear networks versus the linear, or sorry, nonlinear versus nonlinear with a long, deep uh, linear part, you have very similar behavior. Okay, so uh, all that said, here's like maybe one of the most critical questions of uh, thinking about a, a linear network. So uh, like I said, you know, having L linear operators, it's just um, the same as one linear operator. So why do we need a deep linear network, right? 
So there's a lot of uh, related work on this recently. I mean, it's, you know, just so you know, at the end of the day, of course, once you train those matrices, you can store the linear, you know, the single matrix, right? Like the, the outcome is, is never different once you have it, right? So the question is the training process. You get something different when you train this sequence of linear operators as opposed to training just one. Um, so, you know, there's lots of super interesting questions, which is that, you know, uh, there must be some training process on the that, you know, mimicking the thing on many deep linear uh, weight matrices and mimicking that on a single weight matrix. I say there must be, there could be, you know, it's very interesting to ask if that exists and what it is, but we just, we use gradient descent, right? That's what people, how people train deep networks right now. So uh, we can just study that algorithm specifically, okay? So um, the uh, lots of recent work in studying deep networks uh, first has demonstrated that linear over parameterization in depth um, actually yields better generalization across architectures, across data sets. And again, specifically meaning training this deep linear network with gradient descent versus training a single matrix with gradient descent, okay? Um, and, you know, I'll show you experiments that really corroborates this idea, all right? And not only that, there's work uh, that I just named one here, but there are many from, from more recently as well. Uh, that overparameterized linear factorization have better implicit regularization to low rank solutions. So you don't have to actually regularize, but out from the process comes a low rank uh, collection of matrices or a single low rank matrix. Uh, and they also work much better in ill condition and low sample settings, which is closely related to this question of generalization, right? And uh, as a sort of uh, empirical evidence to show you, uh, this is the same uh, experiment as before where we have either a multi-layer perceptron or a hybrid network with three non-linear layers and the rest are linear. Um, and as uh, each here, each um, data point here, we trained like the six layer network on CIFAR 10, um, or sorry, MS left CIFAR 10, right? We train that six layer network fully and report the outcome. And then we start over with the seven layer network and so on in this plot, okay? And you can see for, sorry, fashion MNIST that as you increase certain, especially at the beginning, as you increase the depth of this linear layer, the number of linear layers, then the, um, the uh, accuracy increases, okay? And, uh, for the MLP, it actually increases at first, but it comes back in the same for CIFAR 10. Okay, so, you know, this is something, there's a lot of uh, related work and I'll share my slides. If you click that button, you can see several other citations. It's still, you know, it's something we've really started to understand, but it it's still kind of amazing, right? That just training, L linear operators as opposed to one uh, quite different behavior. Uh, Multi-layer perceptron, just ReLU, linear. So yeah, so non-linear, sorry, I said linear, but it's, uh, yeah, you know, typical uh, MLP, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, without invoking any uh, sparsity condition on the way. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Just training it like very vanilla. And it's also not using Atom or anything. So we're just training gradient descent. In the, yeah, in hybrid. So you see, this is at three. The first three layers are nonlinear in both. Yeah. Depending on the problem, you can conserve more nonlinearity. Depending on the problem, you should conserve more nonlinearity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really the, the you know, again, I don't know if it's like, in, in this field, right, there there's some sort of thing that take a, like a myth 
you know, myth, the mythological status of, okay, this is what we should do, right? Then five years later, someone shows that that's all wrong, right? So right now it says that the shallow layers must be nonlinear, yeah. And how many shallow layers, that's exactly the key question, but the shallow layers must be nonlinear, yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay, so um, you know we're looking at deep linear networks now for this whole sort of theoretical section. Okay. Okay, so we have some theory that applies to uh, two different settings. The first case is for an exactly low rank data matrix, uh, and when I say data, I mean like the output. Okay, so think of a regression setting uh, where we have x and y, and the y matrix is exactly low rank. Okay. The second case is a multi-class classification, so a bit more general, uh, where we have, you know, the output being some, um, you know, one hot vector for each data point, okay, and there are k classes, uh, but k is much smaller than the number of data points, and so uh, this matrix is a fat matrix. Okay, so um, there's a set of assumptions that we make uh, when then uh, proving a theorem, which I'm going to show here in a sort of informal way, but I'm, of course, more than happy to show or talk to anyone offline about the precise theorem. But let me first tell you the assumptions, okay? and then you can be the judge of like their, their meaning and their, uh, how much they restrict the setting. Okay, so the first assumption is that we initialize with orthogonal matrices. Okay, so the weight matrices uh, are um, so that either, well, uh, uh, you know, the weight, transpose weight matrix is identity or vice versa, but scaled by some value that uh, you'll see it comes into play later. Okay. The second assumption is that we use gradient descent. Okay, so we're just, like I said, using very vanilla gradient descent to train these weight matrices. The matrix at layer L at time t plus one is just the one at time t uh, plus the negative gradient. Okay, and we have a step size eta, and we also have a lambda, which is the weight decay parameter. Okay. And if you're interested, this is the form of the gradient of a deep linear network. Also, for this theorem, I'm assuming the weight matrices are square except the last layer. So I guess, you know, I said the thing about the orthogonal initialization, but of course, if they're all square, then it's just uh, the same either just W transpose W is identity is fun. All right. And then this is really the most powerful one and the most you know problematic one. We assume that the input data are whitened. So X, X transpose is identity. Okay. Of course you can whiten your data, but what it means is not always clear. And also that whitening, whitening your data is computationally expensive in this kind of huge sample type of setting. Lastly, whether or not this is a major assumption is up to you. Our output has some low dimensional structure, like I showed on the previous slide, either it's actually low rank or it's a wide matrix. Okay, so under these assumptions, uh, in those, uh, problems that I mentioned. So we're, we're um, uh, minimizing MSC loss uh, on uh, you know, uh, deep network times X minus the output Y. Then uh, we see the following structure in the weight matrices throughout the process, the gradient descent training process. Okay, so uh, actually before I say that, just focus here on this part here. So at time T, uh, the weight matrix can be decomposed uh, into something which has orthogonal 
you know, left and right. It's not exactly singular value vectors though. Uh, and then this matrix W tilde is arbitrary, but then we have an identity times some row that's changing over time. And the W tilde is only two R by two R, okay? So for the low rank matrix, R is the rank, and for the fat matrix, R is the number of classes. So two times the number of classes. Okay, so only this one is is changing, uh, or is non non uh, diagonal and non um, uh, sort of doesn't have the nice dynamics of the rest. Okay, now what are these U and V? So um, that's what this part just before that says. We have two orthogonal matrices. And in fact, for layer L plus one, the right V is equal to the left U. Okay, so since they're orthogonal, they cancel. All right, and then uh, W still has this decomposition. Okay, and notice the U and the V, they don't change, right? They're, they're fixed. And then, yeah. In fact, they just depend on the initialization. So they're different for any random initialization. Okay, so yeah, this is very interesting, right? This is a very small subspace where things uh, seem to have important uh, action, okay? So like if we look at exactly that decomposition that I had, but decomposing that W tilde matrix into its singular value decomposition, uh, then we're saying here, we just multiply that first U by the U tilde of W tilde. We have the singular values of W tilde and the right singular vectors. Of course, those are all R by R, right? So all they're doing is rotating the subspace that we started with, that UL1 that we started with. So the span of this UL1, UL2, VL1, and VL2 remains unchanged through the whole process. Okay. And that we're going to show we can use to, to do compression in the network. Ranjal, can you tell me how much time there is? Uh, we're 10 minutes to 2. 10? Okay. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think. Everyone. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. I, I, uh, yeah, I guess I have 16 slides, but there's some things I can skip, and I think it can work great. Thank you. All right. So, how do we use this in order to uh, you know, talk about compression? So like I said, the V on the right is the same as the U on the left of you know, sequential weight matrices. So if you look at the end to end, W, L to one, uh, we have uh, you know, the same decomposition, um, but uh, with the U's and V on the outside. And then of course, that means we can separate the part where W tilde is changing and this part with the row, okay? And then you see now row is raised to the L because I've uh, multiplied these L matrices together. All right, so uh, the uh, sort of claim is, well, first of all, I didn't talk about row, okay? But row starts at epsilon, that scale of your initialization, okay? so. Uh, certainly if epsilon is small or just less than one and the depth is large, then this term here becomes very small, right? So both the initialization scale and the depth will play a role in how quickly that term becomes small. But if we say it's small and just ignore it, then we can just train in this part here and uh, do training much more efficiently. All right, so that's the claim. Uh, since uh, running gradient descent on the original weights uh, is very close, approximate uh, to, to running it on these compressed weights, then we're gonna just try to focus on these. And these are some plots similar to the ones I showed uh, early in the talk. Uh, those were for this, you know, deep linear network with an exactly low rank synthetic matrix. Here we still have the exactly low rank synthetic matrix, but 
we change some of, or we relax some of the assumptions I made. Okay, so like in the top one, uh, I'm gonna uh, say that I don't whiten the data. Okay, so here you see you have the same behavior. It just looks different than with the whitened data. And then this bottom one, I'm not gonna just run gradient descent, but I'm going to include momentum, some kind of uh, uh, acceleration. And again, you see very different, like not monotonic behavior, but uh, it's still limited to these singular subspaces. All right, so let's look at some applications, which is the cool part, okay? All right, so this is the claim that we can run gradient descent on these uh, compressed weights. And we have two applications of the idea. These are out of order. Actually, the first one is low rank parameter efficient fine tuning. And maybe I'll just talk about that. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask me about the matrix completion, I can talk to you offline. Okay, so, um, you know, we started with the motivation that over parameterization, let's say more layers and deeper layers is a good thing. But of course it has drawbacks, right? The benefits are we have improved sample complexity, improved generalization and so on. Uh, but the drawback is simply that it becomes more expensive to optimize. And hopefully the compression that I claimed uh, can help here, okay? So how do we get the best of both worlds? So here's a very simple thing uh, that uh, many papers have actually already done, started to do, uh, which is to take a layer in a network and just expand it into a deep linear layer, okay? Um, so imagine you have some function, some prediction function, sorry, that's a phi, it should be an F to match our early notation, right? some prediction function that uh, we take some layer, this is the second to last layer, and we just expand it into three, three linear weight matrices, okay? If we apply our idea of compression here, then we can, instead of have three D by D matrices, we can have uh, you know, a tall matrix, three R by R matrices, and then another tall or wide matrix. All right, so in some initial original network, if we just have one D by D matrix, of course that's D squared parameters. When I expand it out, it becomes three D squared parameters. So that's again, the downside of overparameterization. But then once I compress it again, we have only two D R plus uh, uh, three R squared. Okay, so hopefully, well, this is uh, even better than the original you know, for many values of R, but it's certainly also better than the uh, deep one. Okay, so let's see exactly how this thing compares uh, on some, um, some uh, real data. This is, I, didn't, I don't have the name of the data set here, so um, I'll have to look. Maybe CFAR 10 or Fashion MNIST, those are the two main ones we looked at. Okay, so we have a multi-layer perceptron where these are non these nonlinearities are uh, values. And then we have the vision transformer, the whole network. And in both cases, we only take the last, second to last layer and we expand it into three. So it's a very minor change, okay? But in all cases, uh, from the original to the uh, deep linear network, we get an improvement in generalization. Okay, and again, I'm making a very small change, right? Especially vision transformer is a huge network. So I'm only changing the second to last layer from one to three, but still I get whatever, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, something like that improvement, right? Um, and the key is then when we go from the, that deep one to the compressed one, then we uh, basically maintain or even get further generalization improvement, okay? But of course the training time uh, is significantly better, multiply accumulates, memory. Memory is even better than the original, right? With this R parameter is small enough uh, and number of parameters. So kind of an interesting trick 
but we hopefully hope that our theoretical results give a reason for it. Now, another uh, very popular thing to do recently is to use these lower end factorizations in fine tuning. Okay, so LoRa, low rank adaptation, is an extremely popular uh, new uh, parameter efficient fine tuning method. I say new, I guess it's like three years old now, but it has hundreds, I don't know if it's yet thousands of citations because it's being used uh, you know, everywhere. And the idea is very simple that when you update a weight matrix, you just fix the pre-trained matrix W0. And instead of letting the update be arbitrary, you just be a low rank matrix so that you have fewer parameters that you need to, to, to update with whatever new data that you have. Okay, so uh, you have this first thing here, the trainable parameters, just very few new trainable parameters, uh, but you can get uh, as good accuracy, nearly as good. All right, so uh, challenges for Laura is that it does overfit when you have like very few data in your fine tuning uh, task. And it's quite sensitive to the rank hyperparameter, like how big a rank that update matrix should be, okay? And these are exactly the two things that we've seen deep linear overparameterization can help with. And, and so that's, our paper focuses on deep LoRa instead of replacing, you know, instead of putting that uh, just two factor low rank factorization, we have a deep factorization um, and we see uh, what kind of uh, improvements it gives. Okay. So, first, uh, we look as we increase the number of training examples. Uh, how well uh, do we correlate with the output? Again, remember this is a regression task, the semantic textual similarity task after fine tuning BERT. So we have, you know, with smaller number of samples, we do better, uh, but we also consistently do better than just vanilla LoRa. More importantly, um, the rank parameter. Uh, when you use LoRa, if you over, you really have to fit the hyperparameter. You have to do validation to get the right value. Okay. And if you over uh, shoot, so here the best one is eight, so even 16, but certainly for 32, 64, the accuracy tanks. Whereas for uh, deep overparameterization, as you increase this rank, it, it actually still does even a bit better, but it's just, it's not sensitive to it at all. And the really cool thing to me is in this plot, so I'm gonna take a second to explain it. Uh, so when you use just two factors, and really this may be like understanding what's happening here may be the trick to sort of clearing up this mystery of why a deep linear factorization is doing better than a single low rank matrix. So uh, let's train just the two factors. I, that's why I'm calling vanilla LoRa. And you know, I set I set the rank to be eight. Okay, so that's the rank of this matrix. And then I do the deep uh, version, which just has um, um, uh, three factors in each one of the updates. Okay, so I've gone from two factors to three factors, and all of them can have rank eight. That's the maximum rank they can have. Then once I'm finished training, I'm going to check their numerical rank. Right, so I think our parameters like 10 to the minus six or something, any singular values that are below that, that's not part of the rank of this matrix. Okay, so for vanilla LoRa, it saturates, it doesn't find a, a lower rank, right? It's getting exactly rank eight updates to every weight matrix in the layers. And this count here is for the number of layers. So you can see here it's like for all seven some layers, they're all exactly rank eight. Okay. But for deep LoRa, it, when you look at this numerical rank, okay, actually most of them are zero. Like most of them don't have any update at all, or the majority, let's say. Many of them have higher rank update, but it's adaptive. Right? It basically is able to find for however much data is available, 
what rank update should be to get the best performance. And so of course, that's why this doesn't matter, right? Because even if you set it at 64, it's gonna choose a lower numerical rank matrix in order to, to do the adaptation. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna skip this next few slides of matrix completion. But again, if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to talk to you about those. So in this case, actually, uh, uh, what's interesting about it is that it's not really fitting the exactly low rank uh, setting of our theory because the, the matrix, which is masked, right? When you, when you don't see all the entries, that mask matrix is not low rank. So you fill it with zeros, it's not low rank. So you have to do something a little bit clever in order to, to make it fit into the theory that we talked about. Okay, so let me just conclude then. Um, you know, I said the takeaway at the beginning and I hope that I've given evidence for it that uh, training in, in deep networks, uh, certainly deep linear networks, and also we see evidence in, in deep nonlinear networks happens in invariant subspaces. And they can be used in order to uh, compress um, in the training process, also adaptation process um, for fine tuning. And, uh, you know, this hopefully can give a way to uh, use these giant uh, trained pre trained networks in many, let's say, fewer data and fewer computational resources. Okay, I mentioned I have these outstanding uh, collaborators. The top four are my colleagues at Michigan. So John and Sue Min are our students. They're fabulous uh, work that they've done. And then Pong is a postdoc who has done a you know a lot of support work on the project. And then Ching Chu is my junior colleague. Um, and Ching and I advise all three of them together. So you know it was really a, a power powerful group effort to to try to dig into this kind of problem. So. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It was really such an interesting topic. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's perhaps a very small detail, but I was curious about the uh, two particular plots you showed regarding uh, whether there were uh, kind of regular nonlinear and more linear. Um, yeah. So, like, uh, is it the ones players. like. Um, look at the app, the, the scales were different than like. This one? Or a different one earlier? Even before me. Oh, yeah. These, yeah, in, in this area. Yeah. Two, these two spots. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that the scales were different than. And uh, I was curious if you could say something about it. Uh, Do you mean for the training accuracy or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess the rank also. So, I mean, these are, you know, so um, these are for CIFAR 10s. So, yeah, I guess the size in here, see, all layers are 1024 squared except the last one. So, the rank, yeah, the ranks uh, gets smaller here for the fully nonlinear MLP. So the trend is similar, but it's not as aggressive. Uh, and then for the training accuracy, uh, I mean, um, it's it's training accuracy, but it's a bit uh, it's a bit better for the um, for the nonlinear plus linear network. Um, but I don't know if, right. is there, yeah, I mean, you're right. The scales are different, but the idea or the, the thing I want to say is that the trend is the same, whether you have it be nonlinear or linear, but is, if there's a specific thing here, then tell me. Yeah, it was good. Uh, that's small detail. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question, and maybe we can change them because it's always easier to 
uh, process when the scales are the same. It's different as well. So let's see, the compression is a little bit better for the fully or for the linear one. And the discrimination also is better in this case. It's still though, uh, well, yeah, where's the one with the, the training? Or yeah, the test accuracy. So one thing that's important to notice though, that it's still not very good, right? So like, I mean, in the training accuracy earlier, it was a hundred, but, uh, but that's training accuracy. So I should show probably also the test accuracy uh, for that earlier plot. But here we're showing the test accuracy and you can see for fashion remnants, like this isn't, this isn't good, right? This is just uh, very bad compared to state of the art. But the question is, you know, what can we show easily, train easily and show you here? So we, we chose to just train an MLP and then let that standard be fixed. And then as the number of layers increases, see how it improves. Other questions? Yeah. I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, so here you, you talked about fine tuning, but also you mentioned at the beginning of the talk about the pre training, how this could affect pre training. Do you have any idea of what could happen if, uh, if we started using this sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's like, that was what this sort of experiment was about, I guess. So, um, you know, here we're just training them and expanding this layer, mm -hmm. but it's only one of the deep layers. Um, so uh, I think this kind of thing could be used, um, you know, in the original, uh, in the original network as well. The the challenge, of course, is that you know, let's say OpenAI, they have their internal proprietary process. And in order to try something like this, right, if training GPT has, costs $50 billion, then it's like, let's change the parameter that may cost another 10 or whatever, yeah. right? So, so uh, you know, but we can see on smaller problems, on simpler ones, that uh, these minor changes you know, improve the memory by say 20% or 10%, right? So that's a that's an important gain as well. Yeah. All right, let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for attending. Anyone to get my share? Yeah. Um, good. Thank